Well, in our 2020 vision series, we've been gaining clarity for the vision and plan and calling that God has for our lives. Not only for our lives personally, but also for our church congregationally. The place that God has called us to belong to and to be a part of. And to see God's mission come to fruition. In part one, we talked about seeing God's plan for your life personally. Why you are here on earth at this time in history, in this location that you live in. To accomplish God's plan and the, all the things that he has for you to come to pass. And we really found clear sight in part one for our calling. That is our purpose. Our calling is the purpose in which we live and why God created us. And we found out how God has a purpose and a plan for every single one of us. In part two, we also talked about a message called seeing it through. And in our part, in our role to see God's plan through. That we need to be a part of God's plan and to see it through. And we looked at a story from the book of Nehemiah. And the story of Nehemiah and how Nehemiah responded to the call that God placed on his life and he saw it through to completion. And how we too need to respond to the calling that God has placed before us as a church, congregationally. God is calling you to great things like he called Nehemiah to great things. Nehemiah was used by God to carry out one of the most impossible tasks of all time. And I believe that God is calling us to be a part of one of the most impossible tasks of all time. You know, eight years ago, we started this church. And as we began this church, a, a small group of people desired to see God do a new work in our community. And so we, we gathered together and we began studying God's word together and praying and fasting and seeking the Lord, and being radical for the Lord. And as this new work began to grow, we saw God do what we never thought he could do. And that's really been the story of our church. God has always done and surpassed anything that we could have ever thought or imagined. But there's always been a faithful group of people to see it through and believe God for great things. And so you might feel like it's an impossible task to carry out, but no matter how great the task is, God is still greater. You know, when we started the church eight years ago, we started in a season where the econo economy was tanking and, and it was a difficult time economically for a lot of people as well as for churches. Over the last eight years, there's been more churches closing down in our country than ever before and at a more rapid pace. And the Lord called us to start a church at a time where it wasn't a smart time to start a church. But we've seen the Lord do what no man could ever do. And the Lord has worked miracle after miracle in accomplishing his plans and purposes through this church. And then Nehemiah saw the impossible in 52 days when he casted vision because they weren't looking at the size of the great task, but the size of their great God. And so when Nehemiah said, let's do it, let's do this impossible work, the people responded with, yes, let's do it together. And today I want to talk to you about seeing beyond your current circumstances. You see, 2020 vision literally means to have clear sight, clarity of sight that you can see things from 20 feet away that you should be able to see close up. That from a clarity perspective, when you stand 20 feet away from something, you can see it Still with the same clarity, you ought to be able to see it from 20 feet away. That's what 2020 vision means. It's not perfect vision. A lot of people think 2020 is perfect. There's no perfection in 2020 vision. But it does give clarity of sight from a distance, but it also gives you clarity of sight up close. When you, when you have 2020 vision, you can see up close and you can see at a distance. And so too in this series... My desire is that we wouldn't only focus, you like that play on words, that we wouldn't only focus on what's close and right in front of us, our current circumstances, 
but that we would have vision to be able to see things, even what is out in a distance in front of us, but that we would know where God is taking us and where we're going. We can see our current circumstances, but we would also see the big vision of what God has in the distance in front of us. Both seeing in front of us and having vision for the distance are important to have in 2020 vision. And my prayer for us is that we would have both. We would see what's right in front of us and what we need to do now. But that we would also have clarity of vision for the future of our church and knowing how we can be a part of it. And so I want to share with you, talking about seeing beyond our circumstances, from a story in Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26, I want to begin in verse 1. It says, A severe famine now struck the land, as had happened before in Abraham's time. So Isaac moved to Gerar, where Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, lived. So now a severe famine struck the land, and because the famine hit the land, it caused Isaac to move to Gerar. Isaac had to move because of difficulty in his current circumstances. And a lot of times we don't like our current circumstances and the difficulty we're going through presently. But God would have never been able to get Isaac to where he wanted him to be if it wasn't for his present difficulty. And God can use difficulty in our lives in order to lead us and guide us to where he wants us to be. Then it says in verse 2, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. When God says do as I tell you, we would be wise to do what God tells us to do. We would be smart to listen, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's not seemingly in accordance to our plans or even the plan that we think that God has for us. When God tells us to do something, we need to respond with simply listening and obeying. It's one thing to hear what God says, but it's a whole other thing to do what God says. But what, what does God tell Isaac to do? Look at verse 3 and 4. He says, live here as a foreigner in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. I hereby confirm that I will give you all these lands to you and your descendants. Just as I solemnly promised Abraham, your father, I will cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky, and I will give them all these lands. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God says, I want you to stay here. And here's what's going to happen when you obey God. Here's what happens in your life when you obey God, when you listen and obey. God promises that he will be with you and that he will bless you. And I will give you this land. That is the promise that was given to Abraham. Now God is saying, I'm confirming the promise that I gave your father. That same promise I'm going to fulfill and do in your life too. What promise has God given you in your life presently? God says, when you obey me, I'm going to come through and give you the promises that I've given to you. I will always come through. You might be wondering now, but it's only a matter of time before you step into the promises that God has. God told Isaac, live here as a foreigner, as a wanderer, no place of your own. But if you continue and you stay and you do what I'm telling you to do, There will come a time where I'll give you a land of your own. And so Isaac obeyed the Lord. But why why is God doing this? Look at verse 5. I will do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. God said, I'm doing this because Abraham obeyed. He listened and obeyed to my commands, my instructions, my requirements, my decrees. Just about everything God said, he's covering all the bases. There wasn't anything left undone that God said that Abraham didn't do. It's one thing to hear the instruction of God, but it's an entirely different thing to do the instruction of God. 
You see, you'll see God's promises in your life when we listen and obey. And when you hear what God is telling you to do, do it. And you'll always find that God's plan was what was best for your life. This wasn't the best plan for Isaac in his sight. Being in the land of the Philistines, in unfamiliar territory, no place to call his own. It didn't make sense. But God said, I'll be with you and I will bless you. So God makes Isaac a promise to bless him. And Isaac stays in Gerar only because there was a famine in the first place that God used to bring him to this place. Isaac went to this place because there was a famine where he was. Used the difficulty in his current circumstances to get him there. But once God got him there, Isaac was planning on leaving. But God said, no, I want you to stay there a little bit longer. And stay there. And while you stay there, I'm going to bless you abundantly. And then God's plan starts to unfold right before Isaac's eyes. Now watch what happens. Skip to verse 12. When Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted, for the Lord blessed him. Now, it doesn't work this way in farming. You plant a seed, you get a plant. You plant one seed, you get one plant. You don't plant one seed and get a hundred plants. It doesn't work that way in farming. Humanly speaking, you would see your return on your investment. You put a seed in, you get some fruit out, some harvest based on what you planted. But God shows that what's not humanly possible is possible with God. For Isaac planted a few seeds, but returned a hundred times the amount of harvest that he was expecting because God was blessing him for being obedient to what he told him to do. Now the Bible uses the picture of planting seeds in soil as a picture of the work of the ministry. You see, when you are doing ministry, sometimes you have to plow a field and toil in hard soil. But sometimes that's the land that God has entrusted to you. And then you plant seeds. You, you share the word of God. And that's what the Bible talks about, planting seeds. And the, the parable of the sower, as you would throw out seeds, God used that as a picture of spreading the word, the gospel, and planting seeds. And you would plant seeds. And when you plant seeds, you, you would expect a harvest, a, a percentage of fruit or harvest based on the seeds and the amount that you're able to plant. But God shows that it's completely different. Here's what I don't want us to miss. That when you are where God wants you to be, doing what God wants you to do, even when you only have a few seeds or have a little bit to give or a little bit to be used, God promises if you're obedient to him, he can take the little that you have and multiply it a hundredfold. And bring about a harvest exponentially greater than you ever thought you would see. Then you plant the seeds and you begin to water with the word of God. And then growth begins to take place. As we come to church on Sunday mornings and have Bible study and go into God's word. And then throughout the week as we gather and study God's word and, and, and read our Bibles daily and commit to that. We water the seeds and then when we share the word of God, because in order to share it, you first have to read it. You can't share what you don't have. You can't give what you haven't gotten. And so as you then give out the word of God and share the word of God and the work that he's doing in your life, you're watering the seeds. And you're watering the, the seeds that have been planted. And there will be a matter of time until God brings about a harvest in that work. You see, when you plant a seed, you're investing into the soil, but God is in charge of the harvest. When Isaac did what God told him to do, he planted and God brought about a hundred times the amount. And God is saying, if you go where I tell you to go, and you do what I tell you to do, I will bring an increase. And you might only plant one seed, but God can bring a hundred times the amount of fruit from that one seed. 
Then it says in verse 13, He became a very rich man, and his wealth continued to grow. He was blessed by the Lord. And then look at verse 14. He acquired so many flocks of sheep and goats, herds of cattle and servants, that the Philistines became jealous of him. God blessed Isaac, and because God's blessing was upon him because of his obedience to God, the flock began to flourish. Now, the flock, of course, is a picture of the congregation, the church in the New Testament. God is the shepherd, and we are his sheep. And God wanted to expand the flock. But I won't be able to do that, Isaac, if you stay where you are, if you remain in the place of where you've been. So I have to allow some difficulties and some hardships in your current circumstances to get you to where I want you to be so that I can bless you in the way that I only can when you're in that place. And so Isaac was obedient to God and began to see the blessings of God because of his obedience. God says, I want to take care of you and provide for you, but I can't do that if you stay where you're at. Sometimes our present difficulties keep us from seeing ultimately what God wants to do in the future. Because we're looking at what's right in front of us. We don't have 20-20 vision. We have like 20-0 vision. We just see what's right in front of us clearly. We have no sight of what God is doing in the future. And so you lose your job and you're thinking, great, God, you really messed up this time. I have no financial stability. I have no financial provision. God, why did you allow me to lose this job? It doesn't make sense. Now all these things are in a mess and we focus like tunnel vision on our current circumstance. But what you didn't know is that unless God moved you from where you were at, he wouldn't have been able to get you to where he wanted you to be, where he could bless you so much more. And he had another job ready for you. You just had to do a little bit of work. You had to get up onto your feet, and you had to walk with God by faith, and he took you to where he wanted you to be so he could bless you in a greater way. So many times we look at our current circumstances, and we miss what God is doing in the future Because God is like 10 steps ahead of us. We don't see what God is working on in the future because we're only focused on what's happening right now. But my hope in this series in 2020 vision is that you would not only gain clear sight for what God wants of you right now. But you would also gain clear sight for what God is doing in your future. Because what God is doing presently, perhaps in difficulties or in hardships or in current circumstances, is only God's setup for the greatest comeback and what he wants to do for your life. He's setting the table and he's placing down the stepping stone so that you can step into all that he has for you. And so Isaac, his, the flock began to flourish. And we need to, although the Philistines became jealous and started to oppose him, We need to focus on God's intention, God's intervention, not man's intention or intervention. You see, the Philistines became jealous, so we'll see the Philistines begin to attack Isaac and do things to oppose and to destroy Isaac. But God's intervention is more powerful than man's intention. The Philistines became jealous of Isaac and the growth of the flock that God gave to him. So watch what they did, verse 15. So the Philistines filled up all of Isaac's wells with dirt. These were the wells that had been dug by the servants of his father, Abraham. Now, Gerar was a desolate place, place located on the edge of the desert. Water was as precious as gold. You couldn't live without water. You couldn't have water for your livestock. You wouldn't have water for your crops. You could not literally live without water. So when a person dug a well in that time, it was staking the ground, staking a claim to that area. This was my territory. That's the way that if you found water, then you could stay in that region that was otherwise inhabitable. So it was a place to really own when you found water. Abraham had claimed land all over that place by digging wells much, much earlier. 
And the people that were now inhabiting the land were using Abraham's wells. But now that Isaac comes into that land and begins to use those wells, the people, the Philistines that are jealous of Isaac, start filling up his wells with dirt. That was in that day waging war. You would literally go to war over water. You would fight for your right to drink water. That's how important it was. But watch what happens in our story in verse 16. Finally, Abimelech ordered Isaac to leave the country. Go somewhere else, he said, for you have become too powerful for us. God brought Isaac to Gerar. He told him to stay there. He would be blessed there. But Gerar, the actual meaning of that word, literally is a lodging place. It would be like saying, I want you to stay at a hotel. Or I want you to camp out in a tent. It was a place of lodging, but was never meant to be the permanent place for Isaac. He went there temporarily. He was there for the short term because it was just a lodging place. God never meant it to be Isaac's permanent place of residence to plant seeds. But through the difficulty and opposition, God was now moving Isaac to the next place he wanted him to be. And now the king of the place says, go somewhere else. So watch what Isaac does. Verse 17. Isaac moved away from Gerar to Gerar Valley, where he set up their tents and settled down. And he reopened the wells his father had dug, which the Philistines had filled in after Abraham's death. Isaac also restored the names Abraham had given them. So after the king tells Isaac to leave, Isaac could have said, no, I have legal contracts that protect us. I can stay here. I have rights. My father's wells. He could have fought for his rights, but he didn't. He relinquished his rights, and he simply just went along with what God was allowing and he moved out of Gerar to Gerar Valley, a nearby location. But notice, he doesn't build a home. He sets up tents. Again, a temporary dwelling place. Then verse 18, after he reopened the wells, it says in verse 19, Isaac's servants also dug in Gerar Valley and discovered a well of fresh water. But then the shepherds from Gerar came and claimed the spring. This is our water, they said, and they argued over it with Isaac's herdsmen. So Isaac named the well Esek, which means argument. So Isaac moves to the next location. His men start digging fine fresh water, and the people who were jealous of him at that location, he moves, they follow his blessings. Because wherever Isaac goes, where God shows him to go, he's going to be blessed. And there will be people that will follow trying to take what God is blessing you with. But what does he do? He doesn't fight for it again. There's an argument among his men with the other herdsmen that were tending the sheep. But now Isaac moves on again. He names that place. He names that place Esek, which means argument. But then Isaac's men dug another well. But again, there was a dispute over it. So Isaac named it Sitna, which means hostility. First, Isaac bows out of the argument. He doesn't care about winning the argument. How many of you have gotten yourself into arguments from time to time? You don't have to raise your hand because I know you would lie in church. I don't want to tempt you with that. But we foolishly find ourselves in arguments, whether it's with a spouse, a friend, a coworker, if you're really foolish, a boss. You know, we find ourselves in arguments, and sometimes we want to win the argument, but in winning the argument, we lose the friend. And especially if you're married, when you win an argument and your spouse loses, guess what? You lose too. Because when God united you together as one, you've become one. So when one of you lose, you both lose. So even when you win an argument, you're still losing, it's a lose-lose situation. 
And so Isaac, he gracefully bows out of the argument, humbly steps away from the argument. I think there's some wisdom there that we can learn from in our own lives personally. So he goes to the next place. And you know what he discovers? Hostility. People are upset with them. They will try to take his well again. And now, verse 22, abandoning that one, Isaac moves on again. And he moved on and dug another well. But this time there was no dispute over it. So Isaac named the place Rehoboth, which means open space. For he said, at last, the Lord has created enough space for us to prosper in the land. God finally, after arguments and after hostility, after problems in his current circumstances, finally brought him to the place where he could stay. A place of permanency, a place of rest, a place where he could put his roots down and grow and see the flock develop. God finally brought him to an open place. But do you realize it was through constant situations that seemed to be negative and difficult and hard with opposition, with hostility that caused them to move when he wouldn't have otherwise moved to get him to where he needed to be so that God could bless him in a way that God desired to bless him but couldn't bless him if he would have stayed where he was? So many times we focus on what's right in front of us and we don't look beyond our circumstances to see, God, what are you doing? What's the big picture? Where are you leading? And simply trust in the Lord. It's really, really hard to try to trust in God. But it's really, really easy when you just trust God. When someone lives their life, oh, I'm trying to trust God in this situation. I'm trying real hard. It's really difficult. I'm trying, though. It's hard. You're right. It will always be hard when you try to trust God. But in your life, when you come to a point where you simply just trust God, knowing that God knows what's best, no matter what happens, what difficulties, what hardships, what opposition, what hostility you face, you can know God is using that to get you to where he wants you to be. And he's leading you and guiding you so that he can bless you in a way that he wants to, that he couldn't have if you would have stayed where you were. Life is full of digging wells. Just digging and digging and digging and contentions and difficulty. And then digging another well and then starting over again. And digging and digging and then difficulty and hardships and then digging again. And sometimes we feel like, man, I'm always digging. I'm digging and hardships and I'm working hard. I'm trying to make a life for myself and I'm digging and I'm digging. We feel like I don't see, I don't see results. I don't see fruit. I don't see successes coming from my digging. But God would say to us today, if you keep on digging, you're going to find your Rehoboth. You're going to find your place where he can bless you. God would say to us today, I have allowed this to bring you to the place where there will be enough room for you to receive the blessings that I desire to pour out on your life. You have to just be obedient and keep on digging. That's what God wants us to do. Don't miss this, please. I've seen so many people miss all that God had for them. The blessings that he desired to pour out on them because they gave up too soon. They missed out on the miracle because they began digging wells, but because of the difficulty and opposition in their lives, in that ministry or in that calling, they never were able to receive because they just gave up. They couldn't see beyond their current circumstances. They couldn't see that God was using the negative and the difficulty for a setup for greater works in their lives. So they gave up and they truly missed out on what God's plan is. My word for you today is simply just keep on digging. 
Keep on working. Keep on moving. Keep on following. Keep on being obedient to the call of God in your life. And God will finally get you to the place where he can bless you in your life in a way that only he can. You just got to keep on doing it. That's what you need to do. And so Isaac found his Rehoboth, a place to flourish and be blessed in. But the enemy will try to discourage you with Esex and Sitnas, arguments and hostilities and opposition to keep you from ever making it to your Rehoboth. And I share this story with you because as a church, we've had a, a crazy journey. For eight years now, we have been digging wells and seeing the water of the God's word be poured out and people being able to drink from the the well that they'll never thirst again, the water that Jesus gives. We've seen an amazing work happen, and we've seen God do what only God could have done in this journey. We started digging wells in a city called Corona Del Mar, seeing God's word flowing out at a senior center of all places, so we started a Thursday night Bible study just to see what God would do. And so we began a Bible study here at the Senior Center, Oasis Senior Center. And notice, oh, interesting, I didn't even think about this till now, Oasis? Talk about digging wells and seeing fresh water in the desert. We begin at the Oasis Senior Center. A lot of people said, man, that's cool, you started your church at a convalescent home. Different? Different, convalescent, different than a senior center, just so you know. And we began a Bible study there, but we wanted to start Sunday mornings after our Bible study grew. And we wanted to start a, a, a full Sunday morning church, but we couldn't meet there. And we tried really hard in every way and every angle to, to try to get the opportunity to be able to meet there on Sundays. But they wouldn't allow any churches to be there on a Sunday so we had some difficulty, some opposition. But God used that to lead us to the Triangle Movie Theaters where we were able to start our Sunday morning services. And that was, this picture is the first Sunday morning that we had in the small theater, Theater 8, at the Triangle Movie Theaters there in Costa Mesa, about 15, 20 minutes away from where we were. And we met there for a year until there was chairs in the back and there was no room for anybody to sit. People were standing in the back. So we decided to move again because of that difficulty to the theater at the end. No, not that one yet. The theater at the end of the hallway, Theater 3. And the Lord filled that place. And so by the time we were leaving the theater, we had three theaters renting, one for kids, one for overflow, one for our main sanctuary, and then we had this alcove that we called the kids' corner. And the kids' corner was literally a corner. And we set up some, some security things in front of it to make it a safe and friendly environment as much as we could in a movie theater. And we called it our kids' corner. And that's where the nursery was. The last Easter that we were there, we had 19 kids in that little corner, ages 0 to 3. 19 newborns with five teachers packed into this little corner and so we knew it was time for us to go it was time for us to leave and so we took another step of faith and God opened the door for us to move again to another distant land 20 minutes away which isn't seeming to be a wise decision when you keep moving further and further from where you originally started at but we just kept going where God was leading us to go and so we moved to the Pacific Coast location and, and the Lord began to bless you can see this next picture. You can go there. This was our first Christmas service in that location. And the Lord blessed. And we continue to move where God wanted us to go. And we stayed there for four years in that location. Four years, but there was some difficulties and some opposition that we encountered on a regular basis. And so it came time where we needed to move again. Because our wells were filled up and so we moved again and, and we left that place and we came to the college where we currently are meeting in temporarily. But listen, we are only setting up tents like Isaac. 
recognizing this isn't the place that God has for us to be forever. But we desire to see the flock grow and flourish as we plant seeds a hundredfold, even if we're in a temporary location. And we know the enemy is going to do whatever he can to stop the work of God, but we want to see the flock grow where we are at as we feed the flock, as we water the ground with the word of God. We see God bring the increase only that God can bring. But we recognize this isn't where God has us to be forever. And after being at that location for four years, we moved here knowing that we could only be here for a year. And I actually shared from the same passage of scripture our very first Sunday at this location. Sharing that God has moved us again. Sharing that right now we are in this interim period of time, but we're still praying for our Rehoboth. We're still praying for our open space and seeking the Lord for that. And I shared that with our church the very first Sunday that we're here. Now a year and a half later, I share from the same passage of scripture again. To remind us that although we could only be here for a year, God made it possible for us to be here as long as we need to be here. God made it possible with the college for worked out some things and so that we can remain here until God opens up our Rehoboth, our open space. And we're praying that our next move from here as a church won't be into another temporary location but from our next move from here would be into our permanent location somewhere in this local vicinity. Because the church are the people and we are called to minister to the people in this location. And so we've been praying for several years. And in part two, I shared with you that we found a, a building. A building that would have been perfect for a church to meet in. But we contacted the the owner through the representation, and I was told by our representation that it would never happen because, well, there were seven offers at the time on the building, very high offers, and we wouldn't be able to afford very much of what the property would be going for, and so it's not going to happen, and so we gave it up, and we gave it over to the Lord, and we begin praying to the Lord. Lord, where do you want us to be? Where is our Rehoboth? Where is our open space? Where would you want us to go? And two years later now, we knocked on that door again and found out that from our representation, the same person that told us it will never happen told me just a few weeks ago if it would ever happen, if it would ever happen, now would be the time that it could happen. And the Lord changed things and allowed through fasting and praying every single offer to fall out of escrow over the last two years and have kept that place vacant for seven years now. In a market where 97% occupancy in our county is taking place. Seven years has kept that place open. An open space. And so this building that we've had our eye on and been praying for. As a small group of our elders and our, our staff have known about. It's much more than we could ever afford. It's much more that we could ever do with our current resources for this building. It would be, let, let me say this, it would be an impossibility for us to acquire this building. But I believe in a God who does the impossible. I believe God can do whatever God wants to do because he is not limited by our limitations. And so we are believing God for the impossible. And so in this series, I wanted to go before our church and to share the 2020 vision of what we are praying for so that we could together pray as a church. Pray specifically for this location. But I know if God closes the door on this location that he has somewhere that's only going to be better for us as a church. But we're praying for this open space, our Rehoboth. And in 2020, we are praying that God would provide the resources to be able to purchase a permanent home for Regenerate Church. Now, I know and I understand that a church is more than a building, but a building is an essential part of a church. A building really is the skeleton to the body of Christ. It enables the hands to reach further and enables the feet to go further enables us as a church to be able to do 
as a body of Christ what the body is meant to do because the skeleton is there. So too the bricks and mortar, the, the building, is the skeleton to the body of Christ. And as a permanent location would equip us to, to better minister to our current congregation, but also would help us immensely to be able to reach our community. It's a place of permanence, a place to meet and to worship on the weekends, but also throughout the week. A place that we could reach our community and be open seven days a week. A place to be able to host community events and several outreaches throughout the year. A place to provide a working space for our staff. Team nights, our leadership talks on Friday nights. RSM, Regenerate Students, Junior High and High School and College. Our kids, appropriate age appropriate classrooms made and designed with kids in mind. A missions base to, for our local and international missionary works. And it will be a safe place for people to gather and grow spiritually. To, for us to gather in community, a place for Regenerate Church to fulfill its vision, a place of permanency for the community can trust, and a place that we will be here and we're not going anywhere. And it will serve as a visual reminder to our community that God is here for them. And we believe we found this open place. And today, for the very first time, I want to show you the place that God has kept open, we believe, for us. We want to show you the location now. We can put it up on the screens. It's nearly three acres of land with almost a 20,000 square foot building that after renovations would be about 25,000 square feet as we close in the atrium in the middle of where the worship center would be. A place that we have been praying for for two years, but have told very little people. But I want to tell you now, that's a place that we together need to be praying for. If this is the place that God has for us. Every time that my wife Morgan and I, we drive down the freeway and see this location right off the freeway, we stick our hands out the window, then we pray, Lord, if it's the place that you have for us, let it be. Do something supernatural, work a miracle. Lord, would you give us this place? And I cast this vision to you today because a campus can serve the community. And the vision is greater than the resource because if we had the resource, we would have already purchased it. And we would just be telling you this is the place that we're moving to. This is not the place that we're moving to as of now. And I want to be clear on that. But it's the place that we can begin praying for, but a permanent place. And we... As a church, we are praying that by our 10-year church anniversary, we will have our 10-year anniversary service in our own permanent location. That's our prayer. But that doesn't give us very much time. And this building, this location is available now. And we don't have the resource now to do it. But buildings build stories. And I want to share just one with you. I want to share Karina's story. I was at, she writes, I was at the lowest point of my life. I was suicidal and felt that I had no reason to live. There was no hope for my life and I didn't know where to turn for help or hope. Then I remembered a church building that Regenerate Church was renting and decided to go in. I walked in broken and hopeless and I walked out with a reason to live. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and have never been the same. I have the joy of living and serving Jesus. If there wasn't a church building for Regenerate Church to be located in, I don't know where I would, have, would be in my life or even if I would be alive. I was able to turn to Jesus because there was a building for me to walk into, and I walked out of it completely changed. Karina, who is now one of our Our Kids teachers. You see, when we were meeting where we were meeting, yeah, praise the Lord. When we were meeting where we were meeting, people knew that there was a church there because we were able to lease from a church that had been in its community for several years and decades. And so people knew of the place there. And so we saw people have a place to turn to. And they knew there was a church there to minister to the community. 
here we, we have to do a little bit more to make waves in the community. But this property is actually completely strategic for a church. Let me share just a few of those reasons before we leave today. As a church location of permanency, you, you, you really, as a, as a pastor, you want it, it to be visible in the community. Well, as you saw, the property site sits on the 405 freeway and has 335 feet of 405 freeway frontage. It's exposed to over 326,000 cars a day on the 405 freeway in that location. And it was interesting, as I was reading the brochure of the property, it said this, and I quote, this location is ideal for organizations seeking high profile exposure to the community. This would be one way, an easy way for the community to know there's a church here that loves them, wants to serve them, and wants to share Jesus with them. But more than, you know, just having exposure and being visible in the community, you, you want it to be um, easy access from a freeway because people that are driving in that aren't from the exact local area, you want them to be able to attend and be able to drive in. And this property is literally 35 seconds off the 405 and Warner off-ramp, which is only one off-ramp away from our current location. It would take approximately a minute and a half to get there from here. Maybe a little bit more, depending on how you drive. But as a pastor, you, you want there to be room for future growth in the building. The City of Fountain Valley development guidelines for this property allow the building to be expanded up to 62,290 square feet, which is 290 square feet more than the building that we were in previously. So there's room for future growth and expansion, and you can actually build this property up to four stories high. And it sits on just under three acres of land. Well, you also want, you know, there to be room for people to park. Well, due to the low site coverage, 13%, the property is ideal, it said in the brochure, for high-density occupancy that can utilize the abundant parking. And so the parking's covered. Well, you also want it to be surrounded by homes. You want it near a freeway so people can access it. But you also want it to be in a local community, which is usually impossible because you can't have one or the other. But let me show you the satellite view of the property. And around that property that's in the center of this image, those are all homes. Completely surrounding the church property. Well, you also, you see, you need the property zoned for a church because to get church zoning, it's nearly impossible. Cities don't give church zoning. Well, this property has the C1 zoning, which out of all about approximately 19 zones that the city has, this is the only one, the C1 zoning is the only one allocated for church congregational use. It's already zoned for a church. Well, the location is also really important. Pastor, we need to make sure that the location is in the right place. Well, statistics show that churches reach people within a five-mile radius of their location. And let me show you the map. Within five miles of this campus, there is 173,800 residences, homes, apartments, 173,800 residences with a total of 521,400 people living within a five-mile radius of this campus, reaching cities of Huntington Beach, Newport Beach, Fountain Valley, Costa Mesa, Santa Ana, Garden Grove, Sunset Beach, and Westminster. In the center hub of our community, this building would equip our church in so many ways. The floor plan, of a potential floor plan, uh, would, uh, just to give you an idea, would, the sanctuary would seat a little over 500 seats for the parking that would be allocated on the property with very little renovation. There would be a cafe, a 
multi-purpose room that could be used as overflow for future overflow or other events. Students, our kids, RSM, everything that we would desire to do as a church would be able to fit and be placed in this building that we would be able to operate out of. The main auditorium would allow us to reach people. And the -the state-of-the-art kids' classrooms would allow our kids to be growing up in a place that would be made for them. I share all this with you, not to give you false hope, but to pray. Because this is an impossible task for us. But like Nehemiah, who saw an impossible task, but God said, I place this upon your heart, pursue it. So too, we as a church are in pursuing the impossible because nothing is impossible for God. I want to invite the worship team to come up and I want to share this last verse with you. It's from Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Jesus looked at his people and he said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And I was reading in Isaiah chapter 43, 16, in my own devotional time. And I read this and I wanted to share it with you because the Lord spoke this to me about this situation and specifically this message. He says, I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all of its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves and they drowned. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. The wild animals in the field will thank me. The jackals and the owls too. For giving them water in the desert. Yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland. So my chosen people can be refreshed. God said, see what I've done? I've done the impossible. I've parted the Red Sea when your backs were up against it. When there was no way out, I made a way out. And I allowed you to walk across on dry land. When you thought you were stuck, God said, I was just beginning. When you you thought you were at the end, God says, I have just started. And the people of God will be refreshed because I am beginning something new. Yes, I've already started it. And God promises that he can do the impossible. Even rivers of living water flowing out in land that would otherwise be dry. I began praying. I turned to Jeremiah chapter 32. In verse 26. This message came to Jeremiah from the Lord. And when I read the Bible, I like to put myself in the place of the characters. Because I believe the word of God is not just a message for some person that lived 3,000 years ago, but it's a message that God has given to me. And so this message came to me from the Lord. In verse 27, it says, I am the Lord, the God of all the peoples of the world. Is there anything too hard for me? And so I said, well, Lord, that's good. I need to read this whole chapter. And as I begin studying Jeremiah 32, I realize that the first half of the chapter, this is going to blow you away. But when God says, is there anything too hard for me? Earlier in the chapter, God told Jeremiah to go and buy a field. Although Jeremiah knew that the people of Israel were going to be taken away to Babylon and he was about to lose what God told him to get. Jeremiah said, well, is there anything too hard for the Lord? And he asked that question in buying the field. Lord, should I do this? Is there, 
is there really anything too hard for the Lord? Is there really, Lord, it's impossible. Is there really anything too hard for you? And then the Lord answers back and he says, I am the Lord, the God of all the peoples of the world. Is there anything really too hard for me? There was a church planner I know of on the East Coast. And he planted a church about the same time we did. And they've been at a similar journey as we have been. And he let the need be made known among his congregation, similar to what we're doing right now currently, what we're praying for, what we're believing God for. Playing for a place of permanence to reach our community in. A woman found out about this church and their need. And God spoke to her and said, I, I want you to give to this church. What that pastor didn't know when that woman contacted him and said, the Lord put on my heart to give you a gift towards this building. What the pastor didn't know is that 26 years earlier, 26 years before he ever even thought about starting a church, when he was still a little boy, and before he was ever called into the ministry, the Lord spoke to this woman and said, there's gonna be a church in this community one day. And one day they're gonna need a place to meet. They're gonna need a building of their own. And I want you to start saving your money so that when this church comes that I will show you who it is. I want you to give the money that I've told you to save. She saved $8.5 million in 26 years and was able to purchase the entire building for this ministry because she was obedient to do what God told her to do because that pastor was obedient to do what God called him to do. God made a way where there was no way. Whether God provides through this through one person or whether God provides this through the masses of people that God works in our heart abundantly, we're gonna have an opportunity to be a part of giving towards this facility. To say, God, I wanna see your work come to pass. I wanna see you accomplish the impossible. And even if I only have one seed to plant, God, I'm gonna plant that one seed and I'm gonna pray that you would bring a hundred fold from it. God, I only have this, but I wanna give this because I want you to accomplish what only you could do through it. And next week we're gonna find out and I wanna invite you back next week to find out about our part and how God can use us to see the impossible come to pass. But today I want us to remember that if God wants it to happen, God will make a way, amen? When there is no way, God still can, still can make a way because God is the way maker. God is the miracle worker. God is the promise keeper. God is the light in the darkness. And even when we say there is no way, God says, I'm Yahweh. I can do what you never can do. I can do the impossible. Just stand back and watch the power of the Lord. And we're believing God for great things. Let's stand together. If you believe that God can do the impossible, Put your hands together right now if you believe that God can work a miracle. And let's praise God now as if he already did it. In Jesus' name, let's sing this together.